We want to welcome you to our Bible study on Tuesday. It is March the 2nd, hard to imagine. We are well into our season of Lent right now, and I hope it is going well for you. I hope it's an opportunity for you to grow a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And so let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and pray that you would bless our lesson as we take a look at Paul's book to the Romans. May it touch and transform our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we take a look at Romans today. Now I told you last week, uh, as, as we looked at one of Peter's books, how complex sometimes these arguments are when all these run-on sentences. This one is a little bit more of a straightforward lesson, but you need to understand one context. A great big bomb has been just dropped. Bam! 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 That's my, that's my big fire, my big bomb. Paul has just dropped a big bomb on the people who are reading the book of Romans, and that is simply this. It is by grace that you are saved. Not works. We kind of take this for granted, but the unfortunate thing is we still think we're saved by works. We act like we are saved by works. How do I know this? Because how many Christians are telling you, if you don't get your behavior right, you're going to hell. doesn't say that in the Bible. Okay? Well, if you don't believe this systematic theology, you're going to hell. If you don't cooperate with us, you're going to hell. You know, let me use a good illustration of this. Because every single church will at least pay lip service to this idea. Well, it's by God's grace that you're saved. Oh, but then what do we do with people who are gay? They're kind of a good litmus test, aren't they? For a church and a test of whether they truly believe that it is by grace that you're saved or not. Well, if you've got a church that says, well, it is by grace and we accept pastors and uh, members of the church who can be child molesters, they can be drunkards, they can treat their spouses or girlfriends horribly, they can beat them. Oh, but God forbid a gay person walks into the church, they are duct taped against the wall and told that they've got to change their life before they will ever know the grace of God because they're going to go to hell. So why is it one sin? Even Paul points this out earlier in the book of Romans. Why is it this one sin in their mind seems to condemn this person to hell, but boy, we accept everybody else's because they're saved by grace. In fact, even the more ironic thing, I have actually heard Christians try to defend our former president's behavior. Well, you know, he's just a human being. He makes mistakes. They never gave Bill Clinton that type of grace. Did they? They don't give gay people that type of grace. We need to understand this is the operative word for salvation, not this. If you think you can go to heaven because of God's grace, oh, but all gay people are going to hell, then you don't understand grace. Okay? If you apply grace to one person, but not to another, you don't understand grace. It is by grace that we are saved. This is meant to be a mind-blowing experience, an explosion in your brain. It is meant to transform how we look at people and how we look at ourselves. And so this is where we get to our lesson for today. And let's read this. He's, he, he, he tries to argue this. Kind of let me set this off. So he's just dropped this bombshell on us. Grace, not works, that saves us. And so he's going to show us how through Abraham, this has always been the way that God works. See, we still get this idea that we somehow have to do something. It's my faith that saves me. No, it's grace that saves you. Faith is what helps us access this grace. Okay? Well, it's my confession. It's my repentance. i got to repent, and then I'll be saved. No, that's not what the Bible says. It's by grace. It's not grace. It's not a gift if there's something that you do in order to get it. So faith 
is not a work. It's how you appreciate and enjoy the gift of grace. Confession of sins is not a work that opens up the kingdom of heaven to us. It's a response to the gift of grace. And so what Paul is going to do for us is show us how through Abraham, this has always been the intention of God. So listen to this. For the promise of Abraham to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So it's again, not faith itself, it's righteousness gifted to him in faith. And you need to understand that this is how this works. It's not faith as a work that's accessed this to him, but it's the righteousness gifted to him that he gained access through faith. Okay? For if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise is nullified. So if it's all because you're a good person. You know, maybe you've been to a funeral at some point where people tried to justify how good this person was. Oh, if anybody deserves to go to heaven, they will. I actually did a funeral several years back. Actually, it's about 20 years ago, actually. And I remember being at the funeral, very nice man, World War II veteran, just one of the nicest guys you could possibly imagine ever having to meet. And I was so privileged to have known him. And I, I, and, and I said at the funeral, because I thought, thought this was just perfect, I really wanted to say something important. I said, you know, of all the people in the world, this is the nicest person you'd ever want to meet. And if anybody deserves to go to heaven, certainly you'd think he would... But he's not going to get into heaven because he was a good person. He's going to get into heaven because God loves him. Oh, oh I will tell you, it was the only funeral I've ever done where all hell broke loose. Because the, the, uh, the family was furious at me for daring to suggest that he wasn't going to heaven because he was a good person, but because God loved him. I said, well, he understood something about God's grace, and it was a teaching opportunity to teach them that it is by grace that we are saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's go on. The law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, but there is no condemnation. Okay, so think about the law. If salvation under the law comes from those who are obedient. The problem is the law brings wrath. Why? Because the law is inflexible. It cannot meet all the circumstances of life and every circumstance and every relationship. Love is flexible. See, the way I love you is differently than the way I love my spouse or my daughter because they have a different relationship with them. The law is inflexible. It says we have to do the exact same thing for every single person. And it doesn't always fit the circumstances. Law is inflexible. So we can never live up to the law's expectations because to love somebody sometimes means we're going to have to disobey the law. I mean, let me ask you this. Let's throw this out. If I, a thought experiment here. Huh, excuse me. Let's just throw a thought experiment about the law. I bet you, if I were to ask you, is it ever appropriate to lie, most of you would say, no. You know what? I'm going to say boulder dash on that. There are times where it is okay to lie. And you're saying, a pastor teaching us to lie? See this commandment, don't lie. But it's not exactly one of the commandments. But I think we'd all agree that this is a bad thing to lie. But there are circumstances where lying is probably the best thing to do. And actually, you lie every day. I know you probably don't think you do. Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how you doing, Pete? How you doing, Sue? I'm fine. You just lied. You got your mind occupied by a hundred different things. You just lied. But you don't think of it a lie because we've gotten so used to these little white lies, so-called. A lie is a lie is a lie. But I'm going to tell you where lying is probably the best thing in the world to do. You're a German. You're living in Nazi Germany. You're harboring a Jew. And you're 
room upstairs. The Nazis, the SS, come knocking on your door. Are you harboring a Jew? Oh, you're gonna not lie because lying's wrong, right? Yes, I am. Go ahead, go up, take them, and execute them, right? That's what happens if you don't lie. See, the law is not flexible. In this circumstance, I'd say, lie away. <laughs> because the responsibility to love outweighs this inflexible law. But according to the law, you just lie, and you're going to hell. Do you see how that works? So I lied to protect the Jew upstairs in my uh, closet, but now I'm going to hell because the law is inflexible. This is what Paul is trying to tell us. The law cannot conceive of every single circumstance. Even if it's the law of God, it's still a written law that cannot be flexible. But faith, ha, faith. Faith is a trust that God is going to do this for us. For this reason, Paul says, verse 16, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. So it's faith that gains access to God's grace, not the works of the law. Why? He goes on, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all of his descendants, not only those who are of the law, but those who are of the faith of Abraham. Oh, I love this phrase. Not only those who are of the law. In other words, even those who tried to live by the law and tried to live a good life, they didn't. They failed at some point. According to the law, they should go to hell. But they're still going to gain access to God's grace because God loves them. That's amazing. Uh Faith, again, is that trust that God will do it for us. We trust in a relationship, not in us being obedient or doing the right things. We're not to worry that because salvation is in the hands of God. Now, we worry about a lot of things. But when the Bible talks about not worrying, it's talking about us not worrying about our salvation. It's in God's hands. Our eternal future is there and resides in God's care. All right. Faith accepts and this gift of grace, and that faith is a guarantee that we too, this promise, I should say, the promise of God is a guarantee that we too will be participants in this grace. Paul goes on, uh, verse 18, and he wants to demonstrate this once again through Abraham, how Abraham didn't gain access to the kingdom of heaven, certainly through the fruit of his loins or the actions of his, his behavior. Remember, Abraham tried all sorts of things to make God's promise happen. He was old. He was shriveled. He was going to die. He had no descendants, but he trusted that God would provide him. Now, that's kind of ironic when you think about it, because yes, sometimes Abraham tried to take matters into his own hands by having sex with one of his servants so that he could have a descendant that way. God said, that's not what I meant. It's going to be through Sarah, your wife. But she's old and shriveled too. So, yeah, in one sense, he tried to take matters into his own hands, but he still believed that God was going to take care of it, even though he could not figure out how that was going to happen. So listen to this. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to which it had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. So without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his body. <laughs> He's as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And he also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver but grew stronger in faith, giving glory to God. So he did the wrong things at first, but as he went on, he realized, I'm just going to trust God will provide in God's time so that God's promise will be fulfilled. Therefore, he goes on, verse 22, Paul does, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as to one who believed in him, who raised Jesus from our Lord from the dead. So Abraham didn't know about Jesus and that he was going to be raised from the dead. But again, he walked by faith and believed that God was guiding him. 
And that is the call that Paul is telling to us. You are not going to get to heaven by being good. Is it going to happen? You're going to get to heaven just by having faith. Trust that God has got it all under control. Your future, the plan for you, he will take you through whatever challenges you must face in this life and will provide for you everything that you need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again that it is by faith that we gain access to this grace of God. It's not by our works. It's not by our confessions. It's not by praying the sinner's prayer. It's by faith. Yet sometimes we as a church, gosh, we demonstrate a lack of faith. We, we want faith for us, but there are certain groups of people or people who don't fit our expectations, and we just want to duct tape them to the wall and say, well, faith applies to all of us except for you. No, then we don't understand God's grace and how it is accessed through faith. And that people always are going to fall short of God's expectations and God's law. But that doesn't mean that we can't gain access to you. Abraham had all sorts of warts and faults. Did all sorts of things wrong. But yet, he walked in faith. And so God, I'm going to walk in faith today, knowing that I'm going to make all sorts of mistakes, and all I can say is, thank God, it is not my works by which I gain access to heaven but through my relationship with you, through the gift of grace, through Jesus Christ. For it's in that precious name we pray. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you this day. And may God give you a wonderful Lenten journey. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.